Hey, very good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Sean. This is Alex. And you are listening to another episode of Ghost, Ghost of Kings, Kings Radio. Radio. And today we're talking about Silver Dollar City versus Dollywood, the two major Hershey family entertainment theme parks. Last month, well, I guess, is it last month? Well, now, uh, maybe two months ago. Yeah, it was October. I was say. Um, we went to both Silver Dollar City and Dollywood. Um, in a week. Yeah, but in about a week time, like in eight days, we went to both parks. And we had kind of theorized, pretty based on our annual visits to both Silver Dollar City and Dollywood, which one we liked better, but we never really went um, close together. There was about six months between like either park. So this time, hitting both destinations within like eight days of each other, it really made things a little more clear. And I think today, uh, we're gonna just dissect what makes Silver Dollar City Silver Dollar City, what makes Dollywood Dollywood, how was our visit to each park um, in October, and which of the two parks do you prefer? You may already know the answer if you're an avid listener, reader, or um, long time follower of Coaster Kings, um, but let's dive in. Yeah, it's interesting because I think like 10 years ago, I probably would have told you that Dollywood um, was my favorite. In some ways, it still is, but there's definitely ways, for us at least, in which Dollywood is trending a little bit down and where Silver Dollar City is trending up in some of the exact same areas. So I guess we can kind of start with our, with our visits to Dollywood. So um, we visited Dollywood and honestly, the park was crowded, much more crowded than we'd like for it to be, and the operation just wasn't meeting the needs. Um, yeah, sure, rides are running with okay trains, but at the same time, Mr. Man was running one station. So, you know, you're running a Eurofighter with one station, you, you know, even even a small amusement park on the pier can't handle that. And now we're looking at, Silver, uh, at Dollywood, who has like two hour lines for rides, and we're looking at one station operations on a ride like Mystery Mine. And that's just, you know, one of the many examples of the day where it just wasn't that smooth. And then um, lines for food were absolutely outrageous. I'm talking, um, what is that restaurant called? Red's, the one Red's, Red's Diner, Diner, right in front of um, the closed lighting, lighting rod. rod. Um, yeah. And that line literally went all the way around the building, there's back like, to the there's, bridge. There's like over 100 people. Insane. And inside in it's all empty because there's line. not enough staff to like process the food. So there's a line, of an hour and a half, two hours. We're hearing people talk about how long they're waiting. And then, you know, there's plenty of seating available because the, there just simply isn't enough staff. Now, I understand that staffing is an issue in like, the entire industry. It's an issue at Disney. It's an issue in our jobs. I understand that. But at the same time, it doesn't make the theme park experience any prettier when your ticket sales aren't capped. It's definitely, like, Dollywood's struggles with staffing are nothing new. So the long-term sustainability issues with Dollywood are just really being highlighted now uh, by COVID. There's just not a lot of people... Who, who can populate Dollywood's workforce that live within, like, a reasonable drive of the park. I mean, even from e East Knoxville, it's still, like, an hour. Like, Well, yeah, that's not a really that it's convenient way of getting there. Yeah, there's yeah. just not a quick way. The same could be said for Silver Dollar City, but, like, for whatever reason, Silver Dollar City's staffing isn't quite as dire. And I think one of the main reasons that we'll dive into later is that Silver Dollar City um, has less to staff True, yeah. Um, which, I mean, comes into the, to the grand overall theme of like how things are set up at both parks and how it's different. Dollywood's much more of a, uh, a you know, a fuller packed destination that requires more staffing as the Silver Dollar City has a little bit more of a, of a, you know, of a spread out yet more intimate feel to it. Um, so I guess that's why staffing is, is a little different, you know, when it comes to their needs for each, despite them kind of feeling like the same size and the same, same grandi grand grandiosity. Um, but yeah, that was definitely the big detractor. Another thing it didn't quite help was it was actually kind of hot out. Uh, God, I was sweating like was it wearing, was hot. just wearing like regular clothes, like with shorts, you know, like the usual Florida outfit. And um, the water it was rides just were the down. water rides were yeah. down. So okay, well, I mean, I'm, I'm by no means I'm a fan of, of the rapid drive, but I do like Daredevil Falls. I was, yeah, I, um, I've and neither of them open. I've ridden Daredevil Falls in freezing temperatures like if that's a ride that can run because the the splashdown is largely simulated they can turn it off and you can ride that ride pretty much wetness free if if the park is is committed to running it when it's cold out just for capacity reasons you know it can be done another so I issue i was surprised to see it closed this time with the rapids ride too the rapids ride being closed um is really unsightly with the with the flume empty because the midway goes right along it so it's kind of a hard one to to have clothes for like aesthetic reasons. Now another thing that um, doesn't make Dollywood any prettier on a busy day is the parking situation. You will have to hike, I would say nearly a mile 
maybe a little bit less, um, if you're in the very back of the parking lot. It is a hike. Yes, okay, there's shuttles available, but those are also not set up very conveniently. Um, they're the inconvenience of being located in between like two small hills, slash mountains, and having the whole parking lot kind of like bleed all the way through. The parking lot is extremely far from the rest of the park, and that was particularly noticeable on this trip, when even though we showed up kind of early, we still had to park quite far back, and it really made for, for a dreadful walk at the end of the evening. Now, I'm not saying I don't really mind because I like getting my steps in, but I'm right. just seeing these people struggle trying to get in their car. Yeah. Or like the crazy lines trying to get on the somewhat amateur tram situation that's going on there. For a theme park with a status like Dollywood, I'm surprised that the transportation to the parking lot is not set up a little more professional. You know what I'm saying? It feels a little, it feels a little outdated. It's funny because be it wasn't that long ago that they made a larger tram exit configuration like out of the shot because it used to be even you know Dollywood I guess I would say Dollywood has had a history of being ahead of its own growth and I feel like right now it's actually struggling like it's behind there's aspects where it's, it's funny how like they're so they're upside down on staffing attendance is high staffing is low and there's just aspects of the park that aren't working right now and the exit like the the exit choke point with the store and the current configuration with the tram is 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 not working and it's crazy because I feel like they just I mean it's, it's probably been several years now but I can remember when they first they reconfigured the shop to have like less stuff in it so that they could get more traffic through there it used to have a big point of sale in the middle some of our cities is still like that you know it's got the big point of sale in the middle mm -hmm. it's got like a soda fountain and stuff some of our city still has theirs Dollywood took theirs out just to create more walking space for when the park is closed. And they moved the shuttle area back to the current corner. It used to be you you exit the store and the shuttle was right there. But yeah, there was a that, huge... My, my first yeah, few, okay. few visits were like... See, it wasn't even that long ago, and I already feel like they're struggling to manage crowds in the upgraded configurations that they have chosen for themselves. So it's just weird seeing Dollywood struggle with these kinds of problems and I'm not I'm so not used to Dollywood struggling with any of this I mean to be fair I don't want this episode to be Dollywood shit show or like like a shit fest I'm not here to shit on Dollywood I mean we um, love Dollywood you know we, we still very much adore the park so a couple things we'll talk about is kind of just the rides so um, almost everything actually everything was running two trains or multiple trains if you like missed your mind um, so that so that was definitely a plus. They did seem to care about operations. It was my very first time, and I've been to Dollar with like a dozen days now. Yeah. Um, riding Tennessee Tornado with two trains. It was actually really cool. I mean, those brakes are, are wild. Yeah. That was really really fun. Um, but let's start over at Mystery Mine because Mystery Mine recently, or you know, early this year, before the season, got its um, horseshoe, well, it its vertical drop after the um, the myth course and it's horseshoe replaced with a turn and a um, like 80 degree drop or 75 degree ish drop I don't know the exact exact measure it's not it's not completely straight down um, and a turn and up into the next myth course breaker and so it's shortened a little bit and it was definitely done to like minimize wear and tear on the trains make the ride experience a little shorter and to be fair I kind of liked it I mean it, very, it felt smooth and it definitely helped with the ride experience. It was yeah it was fine it's not like it didn't have a huge. I mean, didn't approve it necessarily. I wouldn't say but it that it had a huge overall effect on the ride. I do kind of miss the, the chaotic nature of that horseshoe, but. But if you want chaos, you still get the chaos on the second ride half it, of the ride. You know, the finale is wild. The most chaotic part of the ride. Speak of best finales. The most chaotic part of the ride is the second drop where it it punches you in the temple. <laughs> you come off of that thing. It was like the the horseshoe was a symptom of Gershlauer still trying to figure out you know, what they were doing, with all due respect. And there was a lot of tension on the side friction wheels from when the ride had that hanging, you know, a lot of hang time in that in that curve. So the curve had to go, like, we get it. A lot of people were, like, frustrated with, like, why it needed to happen and, like, why now? Um, hopefully it's just the park reinvesting in the ride so that it doesn't get demolished. I think reprofiling it, putting money into it is, is evidence that they're committed to the ride staying. Um, I think there's still more that needs to be done to improve the ride, like that, that part where it punches you in the face. Uh, a lot of people want new trains. I think, I don't know if that's even really possible for this ride because of the envelopes, like the narrowness of the hand envelopes. I know that's why, like, some Gershlauer Eurofighter-type coasters 
they can do the lap bar trains, the infinity trains, and everyone loves those. But then there's some, even of the modern variety, like Smiler at Alton Towers, for example, where the shoulder harnesses are kind of necessary so that you don't lose your fingertips. And I think Mystery Mine is probably still one of those rides. Like, I don't know if, if lap bar trains are really, like, in the future for that ride, but I do hope that more reprofiling projects uh, are in the future, and then maybe new trains with, like, lap bars won't feel like something that is a huge desire and necessity. The other issue that I have with the ride right now is the train trellis stuff that, like, the theming that is gone now in the midst of... of the yeah, the part that line. crosses over the, mid so, uh, over the midway, yeah. it used to be a lot more themed. It to used, like a it's supposed bridge. to look like a wooden bridge that you dive down because you collapse. So not only is that aspect of the ride gone, but it's super ugly now. Super ugly. It's just a, it's just the steel. Bare superstructure. Yeah, yeah. so uh, that's just, there's just, it's unfortunate. I will say, though, that our Mystery Mine experience improved later in the day. They did open the second station once there was adequate staffing. Like 4 p.m. But it was weird getting to the ride and... and we wanted to prioritize it while it was open because the ride is historically finicky. We're like, I'm not going to tempt fate by not riding it while it's open early yeah, in the day. Yeah, we've had a couple of winter visits where it went and it was too cold for like half the coasters to run. So like two, like there are three or four of our days' experiences at, at the park over the last couple of years included having some major rides down, including Mystery Man because of the weather. Um, one ride that always comes through for us is Wild Eagle, which is of course open this time as well. Uh, running really, really well. If you, if you know our podcast, you know our, our website, coastkings.com, you'll know that we absolutely adore wing coasters, especially Alex and I. So wing, uh, you know, getting getting routes in Wild Eagle is always always good for us. Um, we're glad they're running two trains. Weird vibes, though. The, the ride operator was, ride up. was like <coughs> skewing <me>. some sort of <coughs> political propaganda through the station about was, how people in California aren't allowed really, to ski on roller really coasters, bizarre. but this is Tennessee. And it was just like weirdly yeah, like guy, it was this weirdly political vibe. That everyone was screaming and yeah. chanting, and I was like, "This is fucking Dollywood! Like, what are this, we doing?" It this was so this really weird, like like red state slant that was like super uncomfortable. Yeah, he, he it was incredibly he, awkward. He had read that uh, that uh, a headline of an article talking about like uh, you know California was thinking about banning screaming from rides, like which Japan is something did. that Japan did, but like that like, never happened. Way ago, yeah. It never happened. Um, and so it became his like hybrid. And, then, and, and he I was, was like, like what the hell? you know, California, you're not supposed to scream on roller coasters. And everyone's, you know, booing and hissing about California. And then, but he's like, well, this is Tennessee, and we scream on roller coasters, and everyone goes apeshit crazy, and I'm like, shit. It was the most awkward thing, because we're over here like, up. what like, the hell? <laughs> I was like, as Californians, we were like, this is really weird, like, this is such a weird, this is such like a, 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 par a partisan political slant of like, a conservative nature, and I'm and like, to I be, don't to think be Dolly fair, would, like, have, yeah, would be happy with this. It kind of ruins... Honestly, it was the first ride we rode for a day, no lie, and it honestly kind oh, of yeah. like, it set us up for a, I don't want to say a bad day, because I wasn't necessarily offended, I'm not over here to be like, oh, you know, I'm so offended yeah, by the ride. I'm so offended, right. I'm like, no, But at the same time, like, we're just kind of like, this is just an unprofessional look for the park. Yeah. I always have looked up at Dollywood as being like, um, you know, a regional destination, I call yeah. it. Where like, it's one of those parks where like, has their shit together, it's a destination park, and they really have their staff trained as such, they act as such, they're, you know, they act with integrity. And then there's a certain write up like this, and they're like hyping up the crowd with this like completely negative vibe. And I'm like, this yeah. is Dollywood. Like, I don't, this is not some campfire in the woods. Like, I, I don't come here for this. You know? False information to slander. I don't care slander, what you think, but at the know, same time, the this is, states. it is not the place and time to be the right operator of Wild Eagle and be an old angry man and yell that shit to their station. I'm like, that's just uncomfortable. And now everybody in the like, station's walking around thinking, like, wow. The ride operator said that they banned screaming on roller coasters in California. That's such. It was the weirdest thing. Like everyone was talking bullshit. about it. I was like, "What the and hell?" I'm like, "Oh my god, this like, is why." But this is yeah. East right Tennessee away. is one of the reddest <laughs> pockets in the country, and this time it really felt that way. Like 2020 and 2021 have not been good to the hospitality end of the region because I feel like as liberal-minded queer people running around Dollywood, it was like abundantly clear that we were out of place. But I digress. We still had a lot of positive, very Dollywood branded experiences with other cast members, staff members. Yeah, the guy members. that um, scanned our tickets, uh, he was actually with I actually realized, he recognized us from social media. So if you're listening to this podcast, uh, I forgot your name, but I, um, <laughs> But we remember you. We remember you. So, you know, you were highlight for a day. You got our day off to a nice start, or at least you tried. 
You did your best. <laughs> the other couple of cool things is that, uh, of course, this summer we went to Europe and we rode um, rides like Pagasse Express and uh, Parc Asterix, and we rode uh, La Cala at uh, Bellevarde in, in Belgium. And so we actually went back to Fire Chains Express, the, uh, the OG. Um, we got a front of the line pass because Tennessee Tornado broke down, it dumped the queue, and we waited like two hours for it to reopen. Yeah. We were like determined to ride it. Uh, but then we used our front of the line pass to get on um, a Fire Shares Express, which definitely had the longest line to park. Oh, was, do you like, remember we went minutes. up the Express Pass entrance and there was no staff there? Yeah, that was kind of wild. Nobody was checking, so then we merged, and actually we, we still merged, had our ticket. and we still had our pass. What did we end up using it for? We wrote it again. Oh, no, we wrote Mystery Mine. Oh, we wrote Mystery Mine again. Ah, that's we right. We did something. Oh, I, things I, that we only, oh, I guess we only rode, we only rode, we only felt like riding Fire Chaser once. I yeah, I guess this is not the way to station wait, even with the Fire Chaser station wait. And wait it was like, on the one way. hand, I'm like, uh, should we just like, is it ethical for us to keep the pass? But then again, it's like, well, it's not really our responsibility. I don't understand how... Like, I understand when staffing is bad, like, sure, but it seemed like a huge oversight That's weird, because this is by far the, the exit the pass ride merge the point. Line. Yeah, it yeah. was, we, we, it was a two-hour line that the exit pass, like, saved us from, and the fact that there was not a staff member at the quick queue slash exit pass thing to collect our passes was, yeah, time seemed like, a called, crazy yeah. oversight. Yeah, it was, like, really bizarre. Like, it was another, like, it, it's, like, I understand, like, things happen. And they're doing their best in a lot of ways, but it was so such an un Dollywood moment of like, oh, like I expect the crew coordination to like prevent sort of this sort of thing from happening. But you know, now um, on the quick topic of Fire Chains Express, I was glad I wrote it again because it really does feel like the original. It's kind of like pioneered some of the things that they worked out of um, in the in the newer ones. The trains are the older type, so they are a little bit less legroom, but if you sit in the front, front row, row, which we chose yeah. to sit, we made a plane of sitting room. in the front, it was a um, Really enjoyable ride. I think it's a great fit for the park. Just wish it was a little higher capacity. I think they fixed the problem with both Wakala and Pagasa Express by not having the station being the turning point. But and having longer the, trains. Yeah, longer trains Big and having, having yeah. the station being part of a multi-segmented area so like the the station doesn't fulfill any sort of turntable duties yeah so that way it, you know you can just do the turntable stuff while the train is waiting yeah it's a standard um, very very clever on the new ones um but I, I still enjoy riding it i just think i personally still prefer pagasa because it's so much larger and i think i like wakala better because of the theming and it's the, more and, unique and, uh, yeah and, and the, yeah fire chase is still a great ride but it does it's still a great ride for sure i do feel like it's just the, my only really my only complaint about the ride is that it just does not have the capacity that i think they were promised or what they thought they would have because it is so popular and people will wait in crazy lines for it and I just think it's unfortunate. It's but. the ultimate family coaster there for yeah. sure. Um, speaking of family coasters, we also swung by Dragonflyer. Well, Dragonflyer runs one train because it's a Vacoma um, or Conan clone. And so, even though we really like looking at the ride, we didn't actually ride it this time. We just kind of took some pictures of We've it. We've ridden it twice, I think. Yeah, I think, well, I think we've ridden it more than twice. We've ridden it on twice, on two visits, though. One visit we rode it once, we had like, like an hour for it. That yeah. was the very first time. And yeah. then we went in a winter once. It yeah, wasn't busy, so we rode it a couple That's of times. Right. Yeah. Um, on the credit Very run, fun ride like for them, hour. though. I'm so yeah. glad that they have it. It's, it's obviously very popular, but it's, it's just a good sized family coaster for them to have. Um, so we'll definitely have to say, you know, before we start arguing park versus park, they definitely have, have, a, have you know a good complex diet yeah. lineup. Um, this is a good fit for that, and we're excited to see what the 2022 coast in the back of the area brings. We talked about uh, what it could be in episode one of the season, so go back to what did we miss? That is the uh, the first episode of season four, um, and we'll kind of discuss in, in that episode what we can expect from or what we're expecting from Dollywood's new 2022 ride in the back of Wildwood Grove. Um, next up. Tennessee Tornado. Yes, Tennessee Tornado. Uh, it was worth t those two hours that we sat on a bench, like, waiting for them to it's open It's funny, it. because, like, the line seemed really bad all day. All the toy trucks were full. I mean, they were, they were running two trains, which we didn't realize, because it broke down just as we got in line. So we didn't see if it was running one train or two trains, and then we got dumped. And we were, like, hardcore Tennessee Tornado fans. So we were like, okay, we'll wait for it to be open. Because on last trip, it was down. Like, there's, there was something where we hadn't ridden in a minute. And so um, we got. Also, the rest of the park was kind of unpleasant. Like, yeah, we didn't it was feel like very busy. Waiting an hour for like Wild, Wild Eagle. Eagle. So, yeah. uh, we so we just sat like, in a little entrance sit here. Booth. The staff was cool. They let us sit there for like two hours while they had the entrance actually blocked off. So we're like kind of had our own private hut. Yeah. Just sitting there. Yeah, uh, the they gave us those front of line passes for, yeah. um, for what everyone wanted to use it for. So we waited a while and then it reopened and it ran, ran two trains. We rode it like 10 times. We just kept going yeah. back in line for it. So we still definitely got our rides the in. The second half of our day made up for the, first half. the struggles of the first half. But it felt like we could not catch a break the first half of our day. 
And it, it was really pleasant to ride it because this was right after we went to Magic Mountain. I think it was the week after. So it was kind of one of those things where we had Viper and then we had Tennessee Tornado. That was the week before, or two weeks before. Oh, that's right. Remember? I keep forgetting. We're we're magic after. Yeah, we oh had God. Dollywood, Dollywood Silver Dollar City, Vegas, Magic Mountain. This is the third episode Mountain. in a row where I get Paris. my timeline out of, out of line. <laughs> anyway, right. yeah, that's Sorry. right. I got you. <laughs> but yes, Tennessee Tornado was incredibly wonderful and satisfying, as always. Seeing it run two trains was, like, lovely, because... Once they got their rhythm down, apparently part of the reason it kept breaking down was because the ride definitely has, has ever block issues. Trains, yeah. And it, in fact, the staff, you know, let us pick their brains about it. And the staff told us that, like, management really wants them to run two trains on Tennessee Tornado on these busy days. But, like, the ride is just not always cooperative. And then it ends up being a moot point because you lose so much of your daily capacity addressing the breakdowns that the ride only has when it tries to run two trains, so it's kind of ironic. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's like fine or brake related because you slam into it so hard, it's half magnetic and it's half um, pinch. pinch brakes, so like, you know, old brakes. And I guess it may just overshoot a little bit because like it comes in so hot that if it overshoots an inch, I wouldn't be surprised. And I think it may trigger some sensors. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we're, we're glad we got on and it ran consistently for the rest of the night, so we got plenty of night rides in, it was really good. Um, another really great, great, great ride we had this time around was Thunderhead. Thunderhead. Um, clearly with lighting rods down for months at a time, all their maintenance budget for Woody, for Woody stuff goes straight to light, uh, sorry, to, um, Thunderhead. Thunderhead was running phenomenally well. Um, I always really liked this GCI, but there was definitely some trips where it wasn't running quite as well as, as others. This trip was running really well. Yeah, uh, it Surprisingly was amazing. Some of the best rides I've ever had on we it. We had some think. amazing night rides on it. Um, really thought I had rose to the occasion here. Line for it wasn't that bad once it got dark. Yeah. We rode it, we rode it like five, five, six times. Mm -hmm. We actually ended up, for the first half of the day, we literally got like three or four rides in. But then yeah. like towards the evening, yeah. Um, thanks to this time saver for two of those rides, we, we really started packing some rides in. So we definitely got on some more stuff right before close. Um, so that was really good. So overall, yes, coasters hardly ever disappointed in Hollywood. And despite lighting rod being closed, we still end up having a good day. So like, I don't want this like beginning of the episode where we're kind of like um, showing our, our discontent with our trip to the park compared to other trips in the past. To be a reflection of what we think of the park, we still we still enjoy the park. Like there's no denying that Dollywood is one of the better parks in the United States, especially if we're looking outside of Disney Universal, SeaWorld Parks and Entertainment. It, it is a solid park, but the same chain, Hershey Park Entertainment, obviously has um, Silver Dollar City, which equals, I mean, it offers equally, if not more, as impressive as a product, um, which is why we're just a little critical sometimes to it, I think. I feel like this podcast is, is like an illustration of exactly how our day went <laughs> at Dollywood. I'm like, well, we're going to focus on some rough stuff because that's pretty much how exactly how our yeah. day went. <clears throat> we're talking about some of this stuff in, in semi-chronological -chron order. And it's like, yeah, there's there's some stuff, there's some some tough some tough loving for Dollywood we have that we want to get out of the way before we focus on. The I mean, day. some of the things that like stick out of your experience, whether they're negative or positive, I I like voicing them. Yeah. Just because at the end of the day, like going, you know, ten years from now, when I think back in these days, I'm like, well, what's gonna what's what stood out in my experience? And um, I think, especially with like modern day social media and stuff, parks can't necessarily really afford to have experiences necessarily to be too negative because stuff does make their way around social media. I'm not saying I'm over here trying to purposefully spread negative news about the park or anything. Yeah. I just want to also be like, we're kind just, of transparent we just want to be transparent about our experience because yeah. that's what we're here to do. That's I mean, why we do this. So. And we've got to deal with quite frequently. So, you know, when we have, when we have a down day, we're not, we're not afraid to admit it because, you know, we also hype it yeah. up when we're having to get there. Yeah. We're not, we're not here to like sugarcoat our experiences at parks. We're here to be honest. And I hope that that just continues to, like, validate our credibility because it's like, just because we like a park doesn't mean that we're just going to BS about it forever and ever. We're always going to have valid criticisms for even our most favorite, favorite parks. So, um, that being said, speaking of favorite, favorite parks. Let's hop on over to the Ozarks. Um, so, the main reason we went to Dollywood actually was by surprise because we were supposed to go to Silver Dollar City. Southwest Airlines had some crazy meltdown and then we <laughs> ended up Shocking. not being able to fly on our usual route that required us to get to Silver Dollar City because we fly on standby, which you probably know by now. Um, so instead we were like, hey, let's cancel all of our stuff, like literally like a couple hours before, and then we jumped into the car and then we drove to Dollywood. Um, so the week after, we were like, great, the airline meltdown has kind of calmed down. Let's jump on a plane through Atlanta to Northern Arkansas Airport in Bentonville, XNA. Arkansas, XNA. 
Um, Cute which airport. actually is only like two hours, like hour and a half yeah. from um, Silver Dollar City. It wasn't bad. Yeah, it wasn't bad. So we did that. That was really great. That was a cute little airport. Pretty convenient, especially for going out too. Despite the delays we had. Yeah. Um, and so we went to Silver Dollar City for two days. Yeah. Yeah, that was our consolation prize for not only did we get to squeeze in a Dollywood visit instead of Silver Dollar City, but by waiting a week, we got to go. Tuesday and Wednesday. Yeah, that was the first week they were open on Tuesday and Wednesday. And they were open until 9 p.m. nightly, which is nice because yeah. it got dark at like 5.36. So we really had the benefit Yo, of getting night rides in. We had the park to ourselves. It was crazy. It was Especially the polar opposite Tuesday. of Dollywood. It was open later. and Well, maybe like the same time. But we had two full days. And we had the benefit of it being quiet. So we, Low crowds. We got on everything so many times. And, but st stuff was open. Staffing, and everything was, was, open. staffing was strong. Restaurants, stores, everything. We well, got our water There was maybe like a couple of like smaller food locations or like yeah. retail locations that were closed at like 5 p.m. But generally speaking, it was much more accessible, much more open, much more festive for the pumpkins think, in the city thing that we're doing. I think like the, most amusement parks, like there's some stuff, even any of the Disney parks are definitely Dollywood and Silver Dollar City. There's like establishments, like restaurants that are really only there to serve like their functionality when it's their absolute busiest, even though they're like permanent stands. So, I, you know, I think even on like Dollywood's best day, there's some of their restaurant stuff that's just like not open because I'm not trying to go on days where capacity needs to be so high that they have every single restaurant open. So considering the crowd forecast for these days like the fact that we were going on like the first tuesday in months that they had been open um i was really pleased and impressed i guess part of that was based on the expectations that were set by our dollywood visit but i was pleased and impressed everything was open the water rides were open all the coasters were open they had they had quite a lot of staffing out because there was the pumpkin thing the, the pumpkins great pumpkin, in the city yeah pumpkins in the city was a really interesting festival. Yeah. festival they have this like, festival backlot space that is connected from, like, the Mystic River Falls area of the park back around to the Grand, the Grand Exposition. Exposition area. Yeah. So it, it, it was a unique opportunity to go from one area to the other on this corridor that isn't normally open to the public. Um, and it was a party. They had It was mostly for little kids, but it was a nice, it was a neat thing that they were doing that was getting a lot of attention. And even though the park didn't have super high attendance for the days that we were there. There was definitely people taking part in the seasonal festivities, and it was hopping. It was a success. Honestly, so. the vibe of the park was was really good. The people that we met in the lines, the people that we hung out with and wrote stuff with, um, everyone just... It, it was it was honestly a completely different vibe in which is funny, because yeah. I've always so compared the two parks like on the exact same level that it was shocking to me how much of a different experience I had over all city. And I'm not saying just because of crowd levels and like operational things, but yeah. it was just overall, the atmosphere was a lot more positive. It was a lot more, it, it, just, it was just honestly a really great atmosphere, which is something that is really hard to describe when I'm trying to put it to words. But you know, I, I'm sure that when you visit park listeners that like you will go to a park and then you just kind of have like a sort of vibe, like an, you know, like, like an experience, a if sort of ever, atmosphere. If you ever start to feel this creeping, lingering resentment for the kind of people that a certain park attracts. If you're familiar, if you've been to Park Asterix, you know what we're talking about. Uh, but I think Silver Dollar City, just the people who were there, and we talked to a lot of people because, I don't know, we like to. And we just had so many pleasantries with staff and people in the parks. and It it, it was, was very communal. Yeah. It, it was very fun. And it was not something that we it was One of those things where like, you run into much. the same people all are running, you run into a yeah. time traveler, and then they yeah. talk about like... You know, wildfire, and it was it was much more of a culture uh, d just being at Silver Dollar City um, than I, I've experienced at Dollywood, which kind of leads into our point later, like which park do, do we like better? But of course, you know, there there's more more things to consider. But let's talk about some of the rides, of course. Yes. So, um, Adla Run and like Lightning Rod was running, yeah, which is great because we love Adla Run, and it's my Outlaw favorite run, run, I think, or second favorite. Outlaw Run like, at this line. point in the game, Outlaw Run is the one coaster that will make me fanboy with the best of the RMC fanboys. It's the one ride for me in the RMC repertoire that is so much the hype. And Pitch Black Dark Night Rides on the ride are definitely also Un so much the hype. Freaking believable. Absolutely incredible. Absolutely wild. The best. Every ride in this park slaps at night. And you know, because I mean, these rides are so hidden from view. You ride a lot of these things. I always say you ride 
this stuff, like Thunderation stuff, you write it sight unseen. You get in line for it, and you kind of get a feel like for what kind of thing it is, and then you just kind of write it and hope for the best. And for the general public, that's a leap of faith for a lot of them. We know what these rides do. We look at them up, you know, on YouTube or whatever before we go. But... I always think of Outlaw Run. Always. And, and then, you know exactly what I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah. Because every single time we go on ride it, which we try to go at least once or twice a year because we really like that part. We've been consistent. This is our third it's year in a row. Because we were, in we were in Animal Kingdom's parking lot a couple weeks ago and we were talking about going to, to go to Silverdale City. It's kind of like, matter of fact, like, hey, we, should, we could just like jump on a plane and go. And this guy in the parking lot was like, yeah, I go to Silverdale City. And I was like, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but every time we go to Silverdale City and we ride Outlaw Run, which we always, obviously always ride, um, I always walk up to the ride and I'm like, there are people that walk up to this ride and it looks like an innocent wooden coaster. Yeah. It looks like the wooden coaster from their grandma's childhood. childhood. Yeah. And they get on this ride and they get murdered. I mean, not, not like physically killed, they, but like they get absolutely They spotted. get on this ride <laughs> expecting the boss, Arkansas Twister, Timberwolf, you know, any of the other are any classic wooden, wooden coasters. And all the run is on that ride. Region. But all you see is a lift hill and a little dip and a drop. And you know what? All you remember is the wooden superstructure of your childhood wooden coaster, and you don't make that connection. If you know where to look, you and see the if ride you know where to look. spiraling then, into but, the but final the thing. You're general public, and you're a grandma. You don't know where to look. <coughs> and then you get on that ride, and then it's it, it, it well, it's an adventure. That's the reactions. Like, but right, I always think about it. riding that ride and watching other people ride it while you're riding is such a trip. It is just the responses that that ride gets are. Classic. Another thing it's a complete trip is the fact that we never did the cave tour before. Right. But this time we did the cave tour, which was really, really cool. Yeah. The Marvel cave tour. We talked about it a little bit in episode one of the season. Again, go back and listen to that. Um, tall man's headache. The tall man's headache. It was honestly really cool. I, I didn't think I would be the kind of person that would enjoy like not being able to take a restroom break for an hour and like crawl through, <laughs> crawl through caves. I was having the time I like. It was I had such um, a great time. It was really, really cool. This was another reason why the two days at Silverdower City was like so nice because this is really only something we would have made time for because we had two days to work with. Probably. Day two was so chill. Um, you know, we slept. And you know, one of the wild <laughs> things that you're like 400 feet underground, you're 400 feet underneath the park and like this whole cave system. And I'm thinking in my head like, wow, well, Superman's a little bit taller than, you know, a Magic Mountain. It's a little bit taller than 400 feet. So I'm like, damn, we're like that far underneath the ground. It was honestly just a really cool experience. Um, I would definitely say that when well, next time you're at Silverado City, if you have the time, and it's located in a hospitality center, I think it's called, um, at the at the entrance of the park, you must hit up the Marvel Cave Tour for sure. Another very unique uh, Silver Dollar City experience now, of course, is their brand new uh, Mystic River Falls River Rapids ride. Which, if you're a fan of rapids rides, if you're a fan of Infinity Falls at uh, Sea World Orlando, this is definitely a must ride for you. A um, little fun fact real quick before we dive into the ride experience, the reason it's called Mystic River Falls is because in the cave tour there is an underground river, like a cave river, and they don't know how long it is. They went in there once for like several days and they could not find the end of it. It's called the Mystic River and it runs underneath the caves and you can see the river running by yeah. and it runs for an unknown amount of like hundreds of miles underground. To another destination. So amazing. And so the reason that the ride's called Mystic River Falls is because it's like themed to the falls at the end of that river. Yeah. So that's really cool. Uh, I, I love guys. the tie-in. It's a very... I didn't realize it until after yeah. my own... Going to the yeah, cave tour, we're like, oh my yeah. god, that's the Rapids ride is named after this. Beautiful ride. I know you said you prefer the aesthetic of Infinity Falls. But I'm a modern aesthetic I think that's fair. I feel like definitely... They're both But great. I think we can agree that Mystic River Falls for, is just pitch perfect for Silver Dollar City. It's a beautiful ride. It was a big surprise for me, I thought, because their Rapids ride, they used to have an Odie Hopkins Rapids ride, uh, very similar to Dollywood's. It was one of the, the remaining, like, lingering ride similarities that these two parks shared. These parks used to be so physically similar because, you know, if you're building one ride that works at one park, might as well build it at the other. But it seems that in every turn, Silver Dollar City and Dollywood find ways to offer experiences that are unique to each other, and Mystic River Falls is no is no different, no exception. The uh, Ozark Rapids ride they used to have was good, but it wasn't particularly memorable, and now they have this really unique, uh, fabulous ride that is not like anything else you'll find outside of Florida. I think the only thing for me in this country, was anyway. the fact that it was incredibly wet. Like, it is super wet. Super wet. And um, the water was really cold, and so even though it was October, and like it, the sun was was creating some heat in the afternoon, where we took over hoodie once in a while. Uh, it was still like hoodie weather the entire time we were there. There was definitely some cold moments, like at night. 
So honestly, they're really cold water and me being completely soaked. <laughs> if you know me, that's not really me. I'm kind of like, God, oh, this is really wet. You're really crazy. I always say this is really wet. <laughs> uh, and it was really wet. <laughs> it was really wet. That was yes, really wet. It was very wet. But uh, I, will, I will say that um, objectively, it is a really great ride. It's an awesome ride for Silverdale City, a park where every attraction, they don't really build small stuff. They build really large attractions that have their own area, their own atmosphere, their yeah. own presence. And this is just another one of those. Yeah, it's not a roller coaster, but it's definitely another one of those it's mega a it's like, yeah. you know, its own thing. It's it, it's very marketable. So good for them. Congratulations, Silverdale City, on that. Yeah, totally. Uh, okay, so next, let's talk about... Some classics. Yeah, the OG roller coaster experience the for Silver Dollar City, of course, is Thunderation. The glowing, beautiful, perfect Arrow Mine Train. Well, virtually perfect. It's as pretty much as good as it gets with Arrow Mine Trains. Full of character. I find that as wonderful as it is, I really wouldn't change much about it, except there is a bit of a pothole in the tunnel... Once you're 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 barreling through that helix that gets tighter and tighter and tighter, and once you're about halfway through that tunnel, there's a bit of a pothole now, and it just it, it gets you right in the spine. So on previous trips, we rode it a lot more, but the thing was on our last visit there and um, last summer, um, Wildfire was unexpectedly closed due to a lift hill engine issue. So we spent a lot more time riding, and it wasn't busy at all. So we spent a lot more time riding since. I'm um, sorry, Thunderation. Mm -hmm. I got both from TNT. <laughs> um, so this time we actually didn't ride it quite as much. We still rode it like yeah. a dozen times, maybe. Because again, everything was a walk on for two full days straight. Yeah, but for me, it was. Um, but it generally, was like... we, we, we actually rode other things more this time. Yeah. Our focus was definitely on a different side of the park. Yeah. Also, uh, something we focused on a lot more on our previous visit, the, uh, the 2020 COVID era. Super COVID era visit was um, time traveler. Part of that was because we were really enjoying getting to ride without anyone behind us in our vehicle because they were only loading every other row. Which meant you spend you spend more crazy rides. This time riding it, you know, with balanced vehicles offered a much more gentle, like uh, relative. And it was just busy enough for it to run. Like with full train, so I mean, occasionally we got lucky and we waited like an extra train. Okay, it was, and we running, got our own it was car. running one train, and it didn't need to run another train. Uh, we did get, yeah, we got one ride on it where we didn't have anyone behind us, and that of course was our best ride. Yeah, everything it. was a one train off for sure. Also, this ride just our our rides on it were, and we had no choice but to compare it to Ride to Happiness by Tomorrowland, and Ride to Happiness by Tomorrowland just blows Time Travelers. The next thing about Time Traveler is that like Time Traveler has that naturalistic terrain aspect it oh, has yeah. that it's definitely the prototype and for a prototype it's quite awesome there's absolutely things that um, time traveler does better than ride to happiness but, but overall it's, not as, it's not as intense it's not as thrilling it's not as long um, and it became apparently clear so that was another reason that we didn't ride time travel as much this time even though on our last visit i think that corner park time traveler to Thunderation, we spent so much time yeah. there but this visit we spent a lot more time we did photograph time traveler a lot yeah but we spent a lot more time this time in the in the uh, what I call the, the triple outside of the park <laughs> coasters, which are Wildfire, Powder Keg, and A La Run. Those were our three go-tos this trip. Those were our three big e-tickets. We definitely rode we also did a, We also gave a quick ride on, um, what's it called, Fire in the Hole? Fire in the Hole. Yeah, we gave, our, gave it our, you know, our one ride. Which I, well, I guess we rode twice, but I did appreciate oh, yeah. it more this trip because we did the mountain coaster right next to the park um, called the um, Blah Blah Sidewinder. Something, yeah. <laughs> something Sidewinder. It's at the what, um, Shepherd on the Mount. Shepherd on the Hill. Religious. It's not actually religious. Adventure remember, park. It's something else. Oh, that's right. That's right. I thought it was religious, but it's actually like some related reference to, the folklore to like yeah. Of, yeah. But anyway, so there was like this this dinner show production I think about like the the famous Arson and Branson, which is like these like creepy dudes with like the weird like bunny hats yeah. that are on the right, and it nightmare. always scared me so much on Fire in the Hole. Like it's just a nightmare fuel ride. But now I appreciate it more because now I knew this was about a real story that actually happened in the in the in the Ozarks, like some crazy arson by some like crazy group of people. Uh, I don't know the full story, so I'm not gonna give it to you. But They're anyway, lying. but anyway, that I enjoyed. This trip we definitely rode Powder Keg more. Oh, we were on our started. COVID 2020 trip. Uh, they only had one train, so we rode it once. Well, it was one train here too, but it was just not busy. It was just not as busy. Yeah. So yeah, we got some great rides on it. Really enjoyable ride. The launch is not as powerful as it was, um, like my first rides on it in 2009. But it doesn't really need to be any more powerful than it is. It's a very good ride. I appreciate the ride so much more this time because um, I always thought that the launch was so weak that it kind of detracted from the experience for me. But the airtime was solid. The transitions in the front are really, really great. 
and that giant old bus saw turn that goes all the way down to like the bottom of the ride, like the giant slightly banked turn, it just gives mad laterals, and that's so, it's such a, it's such a weird, but such a good ride. A I moment. really appreciate it. If there's not a way for it, I will ride it over and over and over again. Yeah. There's a way, and I'm always kind of like, mm, okay, it's powder cake. But at the same time, if there's not a way for it, it's it's a ride that we, we hit it, like, so many times. Oh, my God, we kept going back for it. My only complaint is just, I still wish that, like, everything after the lift hill feels kind of odd. It's got the for lift sure. hill, the drop, and then it just goes up into that one little helix. And then no, it's I saw the chipmunks break. and the brake run, so that was cute. <laughs> chipmunks and beavers, they all live in the ruins of the old flume for the Buzzsaw Falls ride that the ride coaster sort of quasi-replaced slash turned into, but... I just wish that, like, the bottom of the drop, they had, like, followed through with, like, the water feature that they were going to build. They, like, got partway through it. There's, like, the little one concrete trough on one side and the rest. It just has a weird, like, unfinished, and not, like, in a fun, like, rustic way, but in, like, a, they just ran out, like, a, like, a marine land Canada kind of way where they just kind of ran out of money and just left it. So, I don't know. I hope they do something with that eventually, but it's just me nitpicking at this point. Okay, but what's the favorite ride there, though? The highlight of our visit this time was Wildfire. So, on our very first visit, Wildfire was definitely Bay. Um, <laughs> we got shirts and everything. Yeah, we have shirts. We have, like, Wildfire merch. We're, like, wild, so we're, we're Wildfire yeah. purists because yeah. it's, it's a really unique B&M that, first of all, is a terrain coaster. Second of all, it has, like, almost like a Tennessee Tornado kind of, like, layout where it's, like, really big elements that all mean a lot, but overall the ride isn't, isn't, isn't that long. It's only 3,000 feet. It's um, short for And it has the only B&M elevated sit-down trains where like, it's kind of like a floorless, but without the floorless like moving parts. So the train dispatch is a lot quicker, but it still gives you kind of a floorless experience when it comes to like your feet not touching the floor. Yeah. Unless you're me. But instead of having like, the fronts of the cars, like Kumba or even or like Hulk, for example, you have it's just the seat backs in front of you. It's a very low profile train. It's got the gate in the front of the station. It's very sleek for like a, a floorless coaster. Train, yeah. um, this ride is just so rewritable, so pleasant. Capacity, of course, is amazing. So and the ride is just really solid. It has a really good first it. drop, back row, mad oh airtime. Oh my god, the airtime! Mad airtime. It's airtime, like a dive coaster, like dive machine back row kind of airtime. Yeah, like Shikra last row level airtime on this drop. Beautiful Another good view. thing is that it has a lot of lateral high speed movement. So between elements, there are generally speaking a turn or like a, an adjustment in direction that is low to the ground. So continuously you are moving very fast um, while like moving through transitions. And that's really different for a B&M. B&Ms don't do that. B&Ms always flow from one element to the next. There are no transitional pieces. It reminds there me. There are no traditional traditional that turns. one moment in Kumba after the zero G roll, where it like does the little correctional directional thing into, into the, Cobra the Cobra roll. roll, except that Wildfire does that like um, between much every, every inversion, and I love it. I live for like these and like high being speed located dirt like on the hill it means that like so the first drop dives all the way off the hill with an amazing view best view in the park 100% so, so stunning You're looking down the lake way away and then um, you have your giant Immelman it's un unusual unusual to start your ride that's like some alpha guys really vibes. really big Immel Immel Immelman and then um, it slightly curves into your vertical loop so that's not necessarily like a big turn but it's still kind of like clearly changed the direction like it's not just it, it's a full 90 it's not degrees just an into exit the loop. into the next inversion. It's a full 90 degree like yeah. change of direction. And then after the loop, you make a adjustment low to the ground that is quite long in uh, like making a slide left into the cobra roll. The cobra roll ends on a lower level than it starts. I love that. And then you have to build your way up. So like in, you go up into this like bangs upper turn and then you level with the floor really quick. Great, great laterals. Great lateral. Diving right. into the, the cobra, screw. sorry, course screw. And then the course screws roll continues into a slanted helix that goes down and then straight up like an airtime hill into the brake into the air like, And those little transitional just, moments that we're kind of describing here, those are make wildfire make the ride. absolutely fantastic. It is so different than usual B&Ms and it runs like a dream. It runs like a dream. Every moment of this ride counts. Every moment slaps. You sit in the back seat, you get the airtime off the drop. You sit in the front, you get airtime coming into the final brakes. There's no bad seat. There's no bad moments. Yeah, I wrote that so many times. The ride oh my God. Two days straight and just runs like a dog. Opera is probably over us. I lost I track how many times we wrote this thing, and I'm not much. I don't really have a penchant for just sitting and riding the same coaster over and over and over again, but Wildfire is just one of those rides. It was euphoric. Yeah, and it's definitely one of our favorites. It was all we could do to just soak it in. We gotta soak it in. We gotta ride it while we're there. 
as much as we love Kumba, I mean, there's things that this ride does that it does better than Kumba. Uh, this ride just demonstrates that like longer isn't always better, yeah. bigger isn't always better. It's just a really solid ride, and views help. Like the ride's views are just incredible. Yeah, the terrain, well maintained, beautiful. I mean, I just can't say enough good things about it. But now, let's get to the part of the episode. Forty-five minutes in, that we're actually <laughs> meant to be doing, and that is comparing Dollywood versus Silverdale City. Let's start with the <laughs> coasters. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so that was your cue. Up. Okay, that's okay. I, love it. <laughs> I did my best. Look, okay, so Dollywood has more coasters, and I think their coaster lineup gets a little more credit, especially with Lightning Rod being like when you get your Lightning Rod. Lightning Rod, rod in, that's considered all rides. Yeah, operating. under the assumption that Lightning Rod is open, like you have a very strong collection of roller coasters with Dollywood, but I feel like Dollywood also has a couple of coasters that are not aging as well as others. And Silverdower City, they've got five. So I will say real quick that I think Dollywood's coast, there are no bad coasters in either chain. I mean, either either park, I'll admit that. But I feel like Dollywood's coasters are a little more fillery. Um, Dollywood technically has two more roller coasters. But when I look at like every roller coaster individually, I think they're a little bit lower quality each individually than the seven roller coasters at Silverdower City that all are each a bit more of a high quality, have their own kind of presence, have their own, you know, they have their own status, got status to them. They're, they're just a little bit more important all their coasters, uh, The average Silver Dollar City coaster is just a little bit more substantial. And they're generally speaking, really unique as in like record breaker types. So we're gonna talk, all our run was the very first wooden coaster to invert like that. Okay, I know some of the beats existed, but we're talking like modern inverting Woody, like the revolution. Yeah. All our run was the first. Time Traveler. Time Traveler was the very first Mega Shade Spinner. Yeah. Boom. Wildfire is this complete its own version. Like, yeah. It's, it's the it's, only it's, B&M oh, of its, it's kind. The only, yeah. The only it's, B&M. I would almost call it its own product line because yeah. it really does deliver a different experience with those trains. And then, of course, you got Powder Keg, which is a Total oddball. Frankenstein oddball One launch off. terrain coaster with a air pressure launch moving track pieces. For 15 years. Way ahead of its time. It was the only compressed air launch coaster. And it's also States. just super different. So now we're looking at an experience that you can only get at Silver Dollar City. Did you say Thunderation too? I didn't get there yet. Oh. <laughs> tell me. Oh, so Thunderation? Well, of course, but tell me like, tell me about what makes it so unique compared to, compared to the rest of the world. I just love, it starts at the top, basically, make, works its way down, and then you get to the lift hill, which is, you know, scenic in its own right. You get that great finale at the end. A lot of people say it's it's the best Aero Mine train, and I won't disagree with that. It's just a fabulous, unique ride that is a true Silver Dollar City, one of a kind. Exactly. You can't just decide to build a ride like that in your park. You and have to have the right configuration. At Dollywood, and we're just, we're only going to focus on the rides that are different each park. So I'm not going to like run the whole like Fire in a Hole and um, Blazing Fury, Blazing Fury argument or to Kitty Goes. Although Fire in a Hole is better, but. Um, <laughs> What I want to say is that at Dollywood, we have rides that are a little more traditional. Okay, we've seen Aero Loopers. Okay, this is definitely a different Aero Looper generation, but we've seen Aero Loopers or Rolling Stock we've seen before. You mean Tennessee Tornado? Tennessee Tornado, sorry. Tennessee uh, Tornado is amazing, don't get me wrong. But I would say that Mystery Mine is the one right there that I think people tend to disagree on. I, I used, that used to be my favorite coaster there, but I've talked to a lot of people who hate that ride. And, and like I sympathize for why... People hate it because it's very rough around the edges, especially in the front row. It has that like early era Gerschlauer Eurofighter syndrome. And not to, I'm like, we love Gerschlauer. Like, we are crazy about Gerschlauer. But Dollywood, for its two Gerschlauers, is really not a good showcase of what they're capable of. Because. And they've got a problematic Woody, of course, which is Lightning Rod. Oh, yeah. They've got Lightning Rod, which is a constant problem. And their Wild problem. Eagle is a. Honestly, like if we're gonna talk all wind coasters written in the world, we love every wind coaster, so there's no bad wind coaster, but right. it's not like top it's not like top pack, yeah. you know? Um, and then another big thing about Dollywood's coasters for Silver Dollar City's coasters, Dollywood's located in the valley. Even though it's like in the mountainous area and there's like climbing some hills, um, Dollywood's rides are usually located like ride layout wise on the inside of the, the hillside. Of the midway. So the rides start on the midway level. And then they go up in the hill and they come back to the midway level. And things are very visible. So it's very you visible. You can see. Like, you can see every ride. What every ride does, you can see. The hardest ride to see is Lightning Rod. Lightning Rod. But you can really see it come back to but the But, like, the Tennessee Lando. Tornado, Wild Eagle, obviously. Like, a lot, the rides are really quite on display. 
in a way that, like, Silver Dollar City rides are not. And I think for the average person, maybe they would rather be able to see everything that they're committing to before they ride. But for me, I mean, the night ride game is not even close. Well, There's the nice thing about why. Silver Dollar City is that, like, the park's located on a mountain. So every single ride goes up the side of the hill and it kind of disappears. Every ride has its own area. It doesn't overlap. You can, unless you're riding physically on the ride, when you're in the, you know, when you're walking towards Wildfire, you don't, can't see any other roller coaster yeah. except for Wildfire. You're walking towards Powder Keg, you can't see any other roller coaster than Powder Keg. You walk into All Out Run, the only ride that exists in that area is All Out Run. Yeah. You know, the only two rides that somewhat have a little bit of overlap is Thunderation and Time Traveler. But when we're going to look at Silver, uh, Dollywood, all the rides are very close to It's other. very compartmentalized. The rides take up a very, like, specific little area of land, and the terrain is not really their an aspect for it's not really an aspect for most of Dollywood ride against like there's some exceptions obviously Tennessee Tornado and uh, Lightning Rod you know when it's open have great terrain moments but you know rides like Mystery Mine Wild Eagle really um, Fire Chaser Express Thunderhead like these are not very terrain oriented rides and whereas that's like a special aspect of some of Dollywood's coasters. For Silver Dollar City, it's it's the norm. Every coaster there is like a best in class uh, night ride, terrain ride, juggernaut. And I just feel like it's it's just a quantity over quality kind of thing, or quality over quantity thing. Where like Silver Dollar City's five major coasters just slap, and Dollywood's top five is still very strong, but. Even with Lightning Rod, under the assumption that Lightning Rod is open, it's still not quite as consistent. They haven't had the same consistency with their hits that Silver Dollar City has managed. Uh, and I still guess going back to my point about what my, with Gershlauer, it's like Mystery Mind is one thing, but I, I, Fire Chaser Express, I don't know if it's aging super well. I feel like the capacity on that ride is so dismal that it. It makes it harder to enjoy, and I feel like even on lower crowd days, the ride is just not accommodating the number of guests that it's supposed to. And it becomes one of those rides where, like, no matter how hard you try to enjoy it, if you have to wait an hour for it, you're like, it's annoying. It's bothersome. And that's not something that Silver Dollar City is dealing with as much. Have we had incidents where, like, we tried I mean, to ride Potter Silver Dollar City on, like, busy days yeah. with one train operations. I mean, I think that goes for, for every park. Um, but but if I'm going to wait an hour for a ride... It's just that rides that seem to be a little more prone to it because the rides in Silver Dollar City are just generally speaking yeah. a little higher capacity if, if everything is running in full capacity. You know what I'm saying? Powder Keg is the one ride that Silver Dollar City has where, like, you may catch yourself waiting in kind of a long line for it, but you know what? If I'm going to wait in line for an hour for a ride, it better be Powder Keg. Because an hour for Fire Chaser Express feels frustrating. And on our visit, people were waiting two hours for it. Just to expand on the, on the night ride thing you mentioned earlier for every Silver Dollar City ride, is that, yeah, so since Silver Dollar City's rides are on, on the backside of the park and are near the midways and are not really overlapping, it makes just for really, really spectacular dark rides uh, or night rides because the rides, when you ride Silver Dollar City's coasters, there really isn't anything out there. It's just a coaster in the woods an occasional floodlight of your wildfire, but Powder Keg, uh, sorry, Powder Keg, Avla Run, those two in particular, and, and to an extent also um, Wildfire, is that these rides are pitch black. They, they deliver some of the best night rides in the world, and they're located in a park in the hills where there's very little development. And I think that Dollywood's rides, um, talk about night rides, they're pretty decent on Lightning Rod when it's operating, as you said, and it's pretty decent on... Um, the other wooden coaster, um, Thunderhead. Thunderhead. God, God it's, it's a long coaster. day. Um, Poor Thunderhead. On, on Thunderhead. <laughs> but generally speaking, there's just so much more light pollution. Even, on the steel coaster. Especially it's... now with Wildwood Grove open, even on, even on Thunderhead, you're, you're looking at these rides all around it, and then you're riding the other coasters, and there's just a lot of light pollution, and so the night ride game is just so much stronger at Silver Dollar City. A hundred percent. But there's also more to these parks, of course. Um, there is the, the layout. So the layout for Silver Dollar City is quite different than that from Dollywood because Dollywood's layout is, is more of an oval, like a circle with one offshoot with a train station and the American County Fair area are. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't even go to that area. We didn't even we go to this area like this time. Area. I mean, it's really dilapidated. We didn't really feel like doing the train this time. The train is ruined. Before we forget, <laughs> wow, the train is ruined. Like, okay, Wildwood Grove is great and the new coaster that they're building is probably going to be awesome. I... Well, no. 
I wish I could forget how wonderful the train ride was before all of that expansion, because now it's just, like, a journey through the flattened landscape. There's just nothing... There's just nothing scenic about the train these days. Except you can see the park pretty well. I mean, yeah, you see the cool. park, it looks great, but it's like... You, you guys, you go up to the train turnaround, it's the last bit of the train that is really scenic, but man, you used to just disappear into the forest behind Thunderhead, and you... I loved it. It felt like you took it took you to another place, and then you came up and you realized you were uh, going higher and higher in elevation. And before you knew it, you you come over the edge and you could see Wild Eagle and stuff through the trees. And and it was the first time I wrote it in post Wild Eagle era. I was like, oh my god, like we're up here now, and like and, and we're positioned here in relationship to the park, and it was just so cool. And now it's like you don't really leave the park anymore, which is it's just the end of an era. I'm just maybe I'm just being reminiscent over it, here, but seriously. That was a point. It wasn't even in the notes. Both have fun trains, but I will say I still like Dollywood's train better because it doesn't do the whole show thing. Yeah, still the city show the thing city. is too much for me. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so the Dollywood layout is, is very good. It, it, it's a circle around a hill, and on top of the hill is Wild Eagle. So everything is really close, and everything is on a midway. Um, but nothing has its own area. We're going to talk like the entrance to Tennessee Tornado is right, you know, if we leave Tennessee Tornado, you're facing another coaster. Wild Eagle and... Fire Chaser Express, despite having very different themes, you know, we share a similar station-looking building because it's very generic in Hollywood. They definitely are. But the it's, same you know, space. the same space. And so, um, that same goes for Mystery Mine and the entrance to Wildwood Grove. Different aesthetics, the same, same space. It's all, everything is on the Midway. It's all on the Midway. Now, for Silver Dollar City, the Midway isn't a circle. I mean, there is technically a circle when there's special events, but generally yeah. speaking, there really isn't even a circle. Like, it's all just like... Silver Dollar City's land is this very organic, like, mush for lack of a better word. It's, yeah. just, it's like a sponge. And Lots there's all of these little arteries. So and... you have an offshoot that goes every ride. So like Powder Keg has its own little midway with a bunch of little, you know, stores and stuff around it and then you end up at Powder Keg. All the rides have like three marquees. Yeah, so because you, know you can't find them. The right you don't know where the hell Powder Keg is until you're like three marquees in and you see Wildfire Powder Wildfire is the best. I mean, you, thought, you go, the go to the lock flume, go under the lock flume and then take, go right. Yeah, so like you're on the midway, you see a sign for Wildfire, you go in the direction, you follow another sign for Wildfire, then you actually have to lock flume. So you follow the next sign for Wildfire. And then you get to the actual Wildfire station where it says Wildfire. There's like five Wildfire signs before you find it. Wildfire. Um, and then the the same goes for all La Run, of course. You have to go up to um, Owen Farms, or no, it's not Owen. No, Owen Farms, Farms is a that's Dollywood. Dollywood. Um, um, some other farm. Yeah, um, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Hillshire Farms. Farms. I'm getting this wrong. <laughs> go me. <laughs> <laughs> so you go up to the farm area, and then there's an annoying gas member that like tries to trick you into looking at something several times. Anyway, and then you get to all La Run. <laughs> Um, at the end of that hall, at the end of that walkway, but again, you wouldn't be able to find Allah Run unless it, was, it wasn't for the marquees. In fact, they have now resorted to riding down in chalk on the floors, um, which like, rides are in which directions, so you wouldn't, you know, forget that it exists. And uh, the only rides that are somewhere closer on the midway are all uh, are um, time, time, traveler, time traveler and generation. Those are right on the midway. But generally speaking, everything kind of has its own area, its own offshoot. Um, when you go to Wildfire, you really are entering Wildfire land. You Wildfire know, it, it, territory. It's, you know, its own area. There's no overlap. There's no other attractions. Um, and I, I personally like it better because I feel like I'm really exploring something. Mm -hmm. It just makes for the authentic feel that these parks are trying to portray, being like little old mining towns and Ozark Slash and the Smoky Mountains. That vibe is gone at Dollywood, in yeah. my opinion. Silver Dollar Sorry. City is very consistent. But Silver Dollar City still really gives that vibe. You're really kind of like just meandering and wandering around. With the, the exception time. of Silver Dollar City's fascination, with, I mean, it has a, Silver Dollar City does a lot of steampunk. Wildfire, uh, the Grand Exhibition, the whole area, and the Wildfire Time Traveler works well with the time are though. very steampunky, and that's really fun, and it works. Like, there's nothing about anything at Silver Dollar City that feels like it's breaking character. Like color-wise, theme-wise, it all feels a lot more consistent at Silver Dollar City. Dollywood with uh, Wildwood Grove is is like a huge <laughs> color punch. Like we, I love Wildwood Grove. Don't get me wrong. So it's the right area. Though. It's yeah, uh, yeah, the '50s area, and then there's like the Dollies area, and you know, there's I, look. I don't really have any problems with any of Dollywood's themed areas, but they definitely have taken on more. <laughs> more kinds of themes and more just more stuff because Dollywood is overall just a larger park and it does make me yearn for the over like the very very consistent tone of Silver Dollar City um 
But I guess that's more of a nitpick than anything. But uh, well, if we're gonna look at parking lots, which may be nitpicky, but the parking <laughs> lot for for Dollywood, you already know how we feel yeah. about that. And in a Silver Dollar City parking lot, um, first of all, there's free parking they lots. Free parking. Second of all, it's just a lot more convenient. Even though you have to climb a hill, like it's like a park on a hill. Um, it's honestly gets larger, wider, easier. On a really busy day, yes, you have to park a little further away, but it's still a lot more convenient yeah. and a lot closer than Dollywood's uh, parking lot situation. And then we already kind of talked about like the whole terrain situation where Soda City is on a hill, but Dollywood seems to be a little more in the valley. Yeah. So that really does affect the rides and the vibes. Dollywood feels very packed. As we're Silver Dollar City, you feel it like you feels, can't even see the rides. Yeah. You know, the rides are kind of just Dollywood somewhere else. feels a little claustrophobic. Silver Dollar City feels like there's lots of breathing room. Um, and then Silver Dollar City has one run really, really, really big plus that Dollywood just doesn't have, and that is the cave tour. It is such a unique experience. It's such a big thing. Yeah. Um, the fact that it's included with the mission is one of those moments that um, we actually gave a Crystal oh, Crown yeah. Award for last year. Yeah. To for, um, to to channeling Ocean Kingdom. It's one of those things where they have an attraction that you would actually be. Would you would you would pay expect to pay it. additional. You would pay more for because it because it's so remarkable. Yeah, I, I, I'm surprised. I mean, I was shocked that it was included with... I honestly didn't realize. Yeah, we walked I up there ask, expecting... Like, included? And they're like, like, oh, yeah, it's included. And, and we're like, like oh, no included. way. And like, I would have probably done it a couple of years once ago. Once you do this just, cave you know, tour, you're just stunned. You're like, I can't believe they don't charge people like an extra 30 bucks or something to do this tour. Yeah, it's it is so cool. So cool. So, all things considered, um, I think we made some good points here, is that in Dollywood... And we, we adore both these parks, but Dollywood's um, lo location with the terrain, um, the more densely packed but slightly less valuable coasters, um, and the more variety in themes makes Dollywood for me a... a it's a more of a mixed bag. It's, it is more of a mixed it's bag. It's a mixed bag. For That's where I feel worse. like Silver City, every time I go, I have a very consistent experience. The park's... Experience like the park's atmosphere and aesthetic and architecture is very consistent. Every single ride at um, Silver Dollar City just slaps just a little bit more, and I just prefer to have way the terrain is set up where like yeah. every ride has a view, often to like the very far distance, and the park itself is located kind of like a little like a little like sprawling hub on, on the top of this mountain. And um, hopefully our points made sense to you, mm -hmm. uh, our listeners, on why we prefer Silver Dollar City over Dollywood. Um, again, we like both, and we'll go both back to both like annually. But I really am on like a silver dollar kick. Yeah, silver dollar kick. Silver dollar city. It's like I don't know. I I love them both, but it's like silver dollar city has just satisfied me more on these repeat visits. I keep thinking to myself like, man, this place is just great. There wouldn't be a thing I'd change. I go to Dollywood, and I'm like, um, let's plant some trees. Let's uh, you know make some changes with infrastructure, you know, this, that, and so on. I would still say that the parks are still, like you said, some of the absolute best in the country. It just comes down to, like, taking the opportunity that we had, a unique opportunity to go to these parks a week apart uh, under what I consider to be fairly even circumstances and dissect the Yeah, two. same same seasonal event, same hours. But we look forward to revisiting Dollywood for whatever their mystery new coaster is. And but I do think our next visit, instead of Dollywood, like, switching it off again, I think our next visit will be Silver Silver Dollar City is a once-a-year park for me. Dollywood is a once-every-two-years park for me. I agree. For now. For now. We'll, we'll see, see how the new Silver Dollar City coaster does. Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. how the new Dollywood coaster does. I mean, while we're on topic, Silver Dollar City might as well build a new coaster. If they too. build another coaster, That'd be cute, but we will I get be there. It. They just build a giant First water ride. One. So, yeah. Uh, before we hang up on everyone, uh, make sure to check out thecoastofkings.com, which has, of course, articles about our trips to Silver Dollar City, to Dollywood. It has information about our trip to Six Life Magic Bond in Las Vegas, which was an episode, um, episode two of the season? Yes, episode two of the season that launched on December 16th. There is also a mini-sode series, so make sure that every Monday you tune in to Cozy Games Radio on your favorite streaming platform, could be the platform you're on right now, yep. and check out our mini-sodes. We are doing a new series called Cozy Kings A through Z, which every week we pick a different letter and then a particular coaster that starts with that letter, and we talk about it a little bit. And of course, also make sure to follow us on our social media accounts. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave a review. Give us five stars, we'd really appreciate it. It will help us grow. And share this with all your friends and family. Do you have anything to add? No, that's perfect. All right. Well, I wish everyone a great night. Thank or good night. Good morning. Or good morning. Or afternoon. Or afternoon. Or afternoon. Good. All right. Bye. Good day.